question of turning sort of research into operations, delivering fit for purpose results to national and local um, end users and decision makers to take decisions that I need to take using the best information that's underpinned by uh, strong authoritative signs. And obviously um, them being able to meet their commitments under the various treaties and conventions, such as the Ramsar Convention and also their commitments under the SDG framework is just one of those needs. Um, and wetlands is <laughs> Um, kind of those no brainer sort of integrated fabrics, if you will, as we looked at this whole landscape of the policy needs and the decision needs so much currently is being talked about in terms of um, the need for nature based solutions that can answer questions uh, within a number of domains, you know, whether we're talking um, sort of regulation of climate, where we're talking about restoration of habitat um, for biodiversity, conservation of essential ecosystems, ensuring sort of sustainable livelihoods, including sort of recreation for people. Uh, wetlands play a part in all of that, uh, disaster prevention, sort of flood mitigation, et cetera. So, I don't have to sell to this group why we care about this initiative in this moment in time, but what I'd like to emphasize to you is that the reason we really wanted to bring this group together now to consider how we can revive the Geo Wetlands Initiative is because we are currently developing our final installment of the Geo Work Program, and we're putting all of our energy into developing it from the perspective of sort of accelerated delivery of fit for purpose results in the way that would answer that those interlinked or integrated questions. And that's why within this gathering, we have representatives from our GeoBond Biodiversity Observing Network activity, eco, um, Earth Observations for Ecosystem Accounts activity. I'm hoping that we have our partners from water-related activities, because like I said, wetlands is that integrated sort of fabric that brings these communities together. And bringing communities together and integrating communities is what we, now, we firmly believe is a piece of the puzzle of for accelerating delivery of meaningful and sustained and sustainable results. So um, in these two days, we hope that our conversations will lead us towards scoping the kind of engagement that will take stock of all of the work that's been going on within these organizations who are gathered on this call um, and figure out how we can do the difficult job of coordination of curation so that the countries, the national users, the end users, the finance sector that is supposed to be sort of ensuring the financial flow towards nature positive investments so that they don't have to do the figuring out which products are fit for purpose? What should they be using? We really want to take that guesswork, the hard work out uh, and away from them and um, be part of providing sort of the easy to use fit for purpose solutions using whatever platform uh, would make sense. So our implementation plan that we ultimately want to develop with um, a group of sort of leaders that we will hope to form at the end of this ideation workshop. Um, this implementation plan really provides a constructive roadmap that forces us to think through all the steps that will take us towards where that impact can be achieved. So it will make us think about the right engagement uh, partners the capacity development, capacity sharing activities, the resources needed, um, so the communication aspects that would be needed. Um, so it's it's very practical kind of um, tool that will help us um, develop an action oriented activity where we can sort of proceed and recognize. Um, when we're hitting the various milestones, how do we know we're being successful? How do we recognize success and how can we um, ensure that um, you know, we, we're looking at sustainability path? 
So I really am grateful to all of you who have accepted our invitation to be here. Laurent did an amazing job this morning uh, running this uh, workshop. And I think you will enjoy this afternoon session as well because he's even more fired up than he was this morning. So Laurent, I turn this back over to you. Thank you, Yana, and I want to uh, extend the, the congratulations to uh, to Samuel and Julie and all and, and Stephen Madia, all the teams that really helped to prepare. It was really a team building uh, experiment this workshop. So, without uh, waiting anymore, I'd like to invite our colleagues from GeoWetlands to present uh, an overview of the GeoWetlands activity. Uh, so, please, the, the floor is yours. Thank you. Great, I think you see the slides now as I, as I do. So, so thanks Laurent, I'll start the presentation there. So th thanks Laurent for, for inviting us and, uh, and helping us actually to revive uh, the, the GeoWetland initiative. Alors many of you already uh, are already aware of, uh, of the GeoWetland initiative. Some have been involved in some ways into, into the initiative. And together with my, my colleagues, Adrian Strauss from the University of Bonn and Lamert, Lamert Hilaridas from uh, Wetland International. So we have prepared a few slides that will give you a bit of a historical background on the genesis of the Geo Wetland Initiative. But we would also like to show with you what, if, what we have achieved during our last, uh, let's say five years of existence. Uh, what were the main challenges uh, we have encountered and, uh, and what is our, our vision for the future of the initiative. So next slide. So the, the GEO initiative was um, initiated in 2017 uh, and essentially to support the Ramsar Convention on Wetlands and provide the, the, the Ramsar contracting parties, which means the countries, with all the necessary earth observations, data, methods, and tools to, to better fulfill their commitments towards the Ramsar Conventions. That's in a nutshell what was the original objective of the initiative. When we launched it, uh, the SDGs framework was just uh, being defined. So we added, let's say, the, uh, the SDGs in our objective. Uh, and I must say, in, in this context, uh, wetland inventory, monitoring, and assessment are really essential elements for countries to ensure the conservation and wide use of their wetlands. And in particular, and it was really stressed uh, strongly by uh, Ramsar this morning, national wetland inventories is a key priority for Ramsar because it provides the core information that is needed by countries in order to put in place efficient wetland protection, management, and restoration uh, policies. So first, a bit of history. In 27, uh, the Scientific and Technical Review Panel of the Ramsar Convention, so it's called the STRP, included in their plan of work the development of a global wetland observation system called GWAS. And the idea was to bring together all available information on the extent and conditions of wetlands and their changes over time. And in 2011, while still being a task of the Ramsar STRP, the development of GWAS became an objective of GeoBond, which is the Biodiversity Observation Network of GEO. And more precisely, the, the Freshwater Ecosystem Working Group of GeoBond, which is now known as the Freshwater Bond. And we have some uh, representative from, uh, from this group in this call and in the morning as well. Eh? And during these years, different workshops were organized under the leadership of Ramsar, but also Wetland International, to define the concept of GWAS and how such uh, global systems, or better, a system of system could support the convention and in particular the countries. And in uh, 2016, uh, uh, we decided to propose to GEO a new initiative, so the GEO Wetland Initiative, to further develop and implement uh, the GWAS concept. And the reason why uh, a new initiative was created for wetlands was simply because of the nature of wetlands, which lies between water and biodiversity. So at the start of the initiative in 2017, we benefit from uh, significant funding from different projects, which allow us to, to have a critical mass of activities that could contribute to advance the concept of GWAS. So I would, need, uh, I would name the, the Geo Wetland series of projects from ESA, the Global Mangrove Watch from JAXA, the uh, Horizon 2020 projects from uh, SWAS, and, and the Demo Wetland projects from DLR, but there were more than this, but it's just a few of them. And for some, some years, the Geo Wetlands has been very active, contributing to many activities uh, of Ramsar, such as the STRP technical report on the use of Earth observation for wetland inventory assessment and monitoring. 
But over the last few years, most of these projects came to an end and the lack of financial resources to sustain our efforts explain why the initiative was as substantially reduced its activities and gave a bit of the impressions to be dormant. Also, I must say that many related projects and activities were still very active in the background. So next slide, please. So what is the, the mission of GeoWetlands? Well, GeoWetland is a community effort to develop, sustain a globally applicable earth observation approach for wetland inventory, mapping, monitoring, and assessment. It's not something that we do in isolation. The initiative was meant to respond to the policy needs from main global stakeholders, such as Ramsar, of course, but also the UN Environmental Program, which is a, a co-custodian agency on one of our most important um, uh, SDG indicators, which is 661. So the overarching vision of GeoWetlands initiative was to fully explore the potential of Earth observation to support the conservation management restoration and wise use of wetlands globally as a contribution to the Ramsar Convention, of course, but also to the 2030 Agenda on Sustainable Development, such as, but not only the target 6.6 uh, on uh, water and ecosystems, but other, also other multilateral environmental agreements. So I should mention the CBD and uh, the post-2020 Global Biodiversity Framework, the Paris Agreement on the global stop stock take and, uh, and also the Glasgow Climate Pact on mitigation and adaptation, the Sendai framework for disaster risk reductions, and even the land degradation neutrality of the UNCCD. And since I see that uh, two of my colleagues from the ecosystem accounting are in this uh, call, I should also mention the SEEA uh, uh, ecosystem accounting. Yeah? So it's a collaborative initiative that aims at leveraging the, the collective capacities of the Earth observation community in a very inclusive manner. And as I said before, our objective is really to contribute to the design of such a global wetland observing systems that would provide the means for countries to build their national wetland observatories. But as a team, we want also to contribute to the Global Wetland Outlook, which is one of the flagship publications of AMSA, and of course, to the global report on the SDG 661. So the objective is really to move to the establishment of a global community of wetland practitioners, bringing together Earth observation experts with wetland practitioners. And equally important, this international cooperation is meant to be in inclusive and to build partnerships among the existing initiative activities and projects. So next slide, please. So as a target audience, we were, and we are still addressing three main uh, communities of stakeholders. We have a number of global actors, such as Ramsar and UNEP, which are looking for, for global statistics and indicators on the status of wetlands and their changes, but which are also looking to build capacities within countries to monitor their wetlands and report on their status. We have a number of regional and national actors, such as the Ramsar Regional Initiatives. We'll, he we'll hear about them tomorrow. River basing authorities, we should not forget them, and of course the countries. And they all have a wide focus, but with different objectives. Huh? They all need indicators to monitor the impact of their policies and to detect uh, hotspots, but for this, they need precise methods and guidelines. And the third communities are the local stakeholders, huh? such as wetland managers or NGOs working at site levels. And they need tools for managing their wetlands, huh? such as information on wetland habitats on the quality of waters, on the inundation regimes, uh, just to give a few examples, but there are obviously more than this. Next slide, please. So GeoWetland is currently based on a rather loose, I would say bottom-up governance and management structure with the University of Bonn, uh, so Adrian essentially, providing the secretariat, but without any significant funding. And it should be more seen as a sort of, um, a core team of partners, uh, so University of Bonn, Wetland International, ESA, and a few others, who, who take care of the coordination and the communication, as well as all the reporting towards GEO and, and other stakeholders, such as Ramsar and, and UNEP, and the broad community of practice involving many contributors at different levels. And for this, we created, or we were about to create a number of working groups uh, that should be uh, the 
let's say, no, how can I say this, that perform at, di at different levels. Huh? So these working groups were intended to have a long-term existence and to develop their specific work plans with outcomes deliverable, supported by their own funding. Huh? I should mention the mangrove working group because that's the, 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 the let's say the, the highest performing, let's say, working group we have in the in geo wetlands, but they were also working group on on the geo wetland portal and a working group on capacity building. Yeah? So other groups were planned to be created as those that went on inventories, peatlands, or toolbox and platforms, but uh, they were not yet started. And then in addition to this, we created the concept of task team as a sort of mechanism for ad hoc activities. I ad hoc activities, yeah, such as the development of specific report as uh, the STRP report that I mentioned before on the use of Earth observation for wetland inventory assessment and monitoring. But the lack of resources we mentioned in the introductions have led to some discontinuity in the activities of some of these groups. We were lacking, let's say, the resources, the resources to move all this into a solid governance uh, structures to meet uh, the level of our ambitions. So next slide, please. So what did we achieve? Uh, you would all agree that Earth observation is in increasingly recognized an essential tool for conducting national wetland inventories, for characterizing wetland habitats, for monitoring the flood regimes and the well functioning of the ecosystems, for assessing the impact of the drivers of changes, for quantifying the benefits of wetland ecosystems and their services to people. And it's also an important tool for countries to report on their multilateral environmental agreement, as Jana said. Huh? Uh, so I should mention the, 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 the SDG indicator 661 on the change of the extent to, in the extent of water related ecosystems, where EO is actually explicitly mentioned in the guidelines. But it's also a technology that is hard to be used by countries. And hence the need for a toolkit that can serve as a sort of practical guidelines with high quality and curated data sets and tools. Huh? And Geo Wetland started the development of uh, some components of an Earth Observation Toolkit for wetlands, even before the concept of the Geo Earth Observation Toolkits came true. Huh? And I'm sure that some of you are already, already aware of the Geo EO Toolkit for Sustainable Cities that Geo is developing with UN Habitat. And we had exactly the same ideas. So we prototype what we call a wetland knowledge base to provide access to wetland related data set, methodological guidelines, software tools, case studies, training uh, courses, which are all elements expected to be present in, a, in such a toolkit. Eh? And, and there are elements that provide practical guidelines for our stakeholders to embrace uh, observations in their practices. And we also prototype a geospatial data portal as a sort of global viewer of wetland maps and indicators. So while uh, already available online, uh, further development are needed really to convert this knowledge base and, and the geospatial data portal into an operational system. So we are still lacking content and we need also to have the adequate resource to manage all this. Huh? So next slide, please. So the knowledge base has already a number of tools, data sets, methodologies, or case studies accessible as you can see on this slide. So just to give you a few examples for the tools, we, we, we show the, the, the Globe Wetland Africa toolbox and the geoclassifier of SWAS. SWAS will be presented uh, this afternoon. And as, as an example of data sets, uh, we show the Global Surface Water Explorer from GRC and the Global Mangrove Watch from, from JAXA. So once more, operational status of the knowledge base and the geoportal will be achieved. New tools and data sets, maps and storytelling will be incorporated into, into the systems. So what is our vision uh, for the geo wetland toolkits? Huh? First, it's meant to be a, a fully interactive application accessible by the broad community of diverse uh, wetland stakeholders. It will provide a, a seamless access to a large set of data sets, tools, platforms, methodology studies, articles to share knowledge among, amongst the wetland community. It will improve the quality and the availability of wetland information for providing analysis and statistical tools that can be applied on existing data set. It will support the collaborations across disciplines. It will strengthen, strengthen the capacities of the regional, national, and local stakeholders. So our vision is that all these new capabilities will allow the geo wetland toolkits to, to further stimulate the international collaboration on the sustainable management, protection, and restoration of wetland ecosystems. So my last slide is, uh, is uh, what we need to achieve to, uh, to, to meet our level of ambitions. First, we need to define together a new implementation plan with a revised uh, missions, goals, objective, and deliverable. 
Second, we need to set up a solid governance structures with clear roles and responsibilities. Third, we need to have a strong engagement from the community to contribute to the implementation of geo-wetlands. Fourth, we need to have some resource mobilization to have the means to develop and operationalize the components of the toolkits. And fifth, and it's even the most important one, we need an ambitious outreach programs to build uh, the, this committee of practices that we are aiming at. So with this, I'm done with my presentation. I hope that it um, uh, clarifies our, our level of, um, of ambitions and it also yeah, convince you to, to join the team, if I can say this. Thank you so much, Mark, for this very nice presentation. I think it clarifies a lot uh, why we are here today. And, and also thanks to, to open this GeoWetland initiative to a, a, our broader international community. And, and I've seen great people uh, joining here, like John Milak from University of Santa Barbara. Hi, John, very nice to see you. It's a lot of, I saw also people from UNEP and, and, and also friends from INPI, a lot of uh, Brazilian colleagues. So hi, everyone. Uh, uh, again, uh, thank you, Mark. And uh, we will now jump to our next presentation uh, from uh, Maria Rivera from the Secretary of the Ramsar Convention on Wetlands. Uh, Maria, um, uh, the floor is yours. Sorry, Maria, because you, you, you are the only one. I mean, the Geo Wetlands for us, it could. Uh, one present in the morning, another one, you will be the only one with, with our director, Yana, to present twice today. So thank you so much for the effort. Uh, the floor is yours. You can share your screen, Maria, please, to, to share your presentation. Thank you. Thank you. So good afternoon uh, from, from Switzerland. So I will share my screen. OK, so I will present a brief overview of uh, what is the role of the Ransard Convention regarding national well and inventories and as well uh, our work regarding with the sustainable development uh, goals. So I work in, in the secretariat as a senior advisor dealing with different matters. So I particularly did the work on SDGs, in particular um, SDG 6 um, uh, and also other global processes at the Convention on Biological uh, Diversity among, among others. So regarding uh, wetland inventory, uh, the, uh, it has been recognized since 1980 under the convention, uh, their importance as a key tool for informing national policies and other measures to achieve the conservation and wide use of, of wetlands. Also, it is important uh, that you are aware that has always as well been a target of the, of the strategic plan and is currently a target uh, eight in the current uh, strategic plan. Also contracting parties have given a, a, a refresh uh, interest and uh, uh, on, on that, that they really work more strongly uh, in order that parties can achieve the completion of, of national wetland inventory in this triennium that we are closing. So we are in a gap year and, and this triennium will be closed in November this year uh, during COP14. Uh, so in this regard, parties uh, have uh, making an effort that uh, on the need to step up uh, the support in general from us as a secretariat in completing and keeping um, and to update their national wetland inventories. Also uh, from the wetlands outlook launching, the first one wetland outlook that was launched in, in 2018 during uh, co 13, it's one, one of course is clear, natural, the recommendation that the data needs to be more, uh, more accurate and of course increase uh, more, uh, more data uh, regarding national wetland uh, inventories. Also, the decision of, of uh, giving priority to, um, to wetland inventories is related uh, for a particular issue, and is that, as I mentioned before, wetland inventory has always one of the targets in Ransar strategic plan, and always parties have reported on this uh, on their national reports uh, uh, to the conventions every every three uh, three years. So the data mainly on wetland inventories come from from national report. But other important element is, is that in, in 2016, uh, the convention was appointed with the United Nations Environmental Program as co-custodian on indicator 61, that is the chain in the stand on water related ecosystem over time. So in the, there are two reporting lines and in, one is come from UNEP and the other for this indicator and the other one come from the data provided by contracting parties through, through the national report under, under the convention. So use the requirements, uh, uh, under the under the convention in order to provide this uh, uh, this data also it's very important that uh, 
uh, wetland stand has been included and we have was working with parties in order that uh, this uh, indicator and wetland stand is included in the global biodiversity framework that is under, develop under development. And we are happy to say that because of these efforts, this indicator is now being proposed as a headline indicator on goal A. Uh, also, uh, under the process, because we have been uh, as well appointed as global partner of the UN Decade on, on, on Restoration and our work uh, and engagement on the different task forces, uh, this indicator, uh, 6 is 1, as long as other three indicators coming, coming from the national report uh, under the convention are now included in the monitoring framework of the UN Decade of restoration. So this is the linkages, how the, of course the convention contribute contribute to this uh, policy uh, policy process or mark the policy process, the global, the global agenda and their other and their other MEAs. So when parties of course report the, the elements and the requirements under the conventions uh, relate uh, first with the definition of wetlands, as you know, under the convention, there is an agreement on a wetland definition that it doesn't prevent, of course, that uh, some parties have uh, um, prepared uh, their own uh, and or adapt this definition to the, to the national levels. But in order to report under the convention, of course, the terminology uses the First, in first place, the definition of wetlands under the convention, and the third key element uh, uh, that is used is the Ransar classification system for wetland types. That is an international applica uh, applicable habitat description that was adopted by parties since the 1990s. Uh, in this regard, uh, in the national reports of contracting party report are in the three main categories of the Ransar classification system, that is marine and coastal, inland and human made wetlands. So as, as this indicator 61 in the streamline uh, from the convention is mainly fresh water, we report to the UN statistical divisions only in inland and human made uh, wetlands data. However, we of course and party report also on marine and coastal. So of course we keep as well uh, that, uh, that information. So regarding what is the status on, on how parties report on wetland, uh, wetland inventories and wetland stand. So with the data we have for COP13, we are preparing a new report uh, that will be presented in, in COP14 uh, in November this year. So for COP13 in 2018, 44% of the contracting parties have uh, completed national wetland inventories, and it's an important number still that is in progress. We will see how these figures, uh, we can make some comparison a little bit of trends uh, based on, on what will be the report that we have uh, received so far for COP uh, for COP 14. So still, as you see, that there are important efforts to be made in order that the, the that, that all contracting parties under the convention can complete the, their national wetland uh, inventories. That that by the way was a, a target for the previous strategic plans. It was expected by two, uh, 2015, all parties should have completed national wetland inventories and we'll see that is still, this is not uh, the case. Then uh, in summary, so as being co-custodian with the unit of indicator 61, we, we, we track uh, the global wetland status and trends of, uh, that help to measure progress toward SDGs uh, 6. Uh, for this post board, we, we got uh, as well the mandate uh, from contracting uh, parties to continue making efforts to support their efforts to complete or update national wetland inventories. And for this, we, we repackage, like I said, in a, in a fresh and innovative way, the, all the guidance are the, the convention that has been prepared by uh, our scientific and technical review panel and adopted many years ago by, uh, by, by the convention, by the, by the parties. So in 2020, we, we launched a, a new toolkit for national wetland inventories. And also we uh, undertake the first part, let's say, of training to support contracting parties in, in conducting national wetland inventories using, using the toolkit uh, and also to reporting on, on, on wetland stand. Uh, in this uh, toolkit, we included of, uh, the, the chapter that will be presented later on by, uh, by uh, our vice chair of the scientific and technical review panel and the work that they have done under the STRP on air observation. So included that part as well uh, in, the, in this new, um, in this, uh, new toolkit. Also, how we come together as well with UNEP, and of course, uh, being co-custodian, uh, we we of course are discussing many many areas of of, of uh, working together and, and collaboration. But also, uh, we prepare uh, jointly storylines uh, for the UN Secretary General report for the high-level political forum uh, that is the report 
on sustainable development goals. So every year we do uh, we do uh, that uh, together. So regarding our priorities, as, as I mentioned, is to continue supporting parties according to the mandate that, that we have on this, on, on, on this um, process of inventory. So we are preparing a microsite in the convention with all information about SDGs, uh, the new uh, toolkit on wetland inventory, the data that, that the parties have submitted uh, regarding uh, um, uh, STEM. Uh, also, we created since 2020 a help desk to support contracting parties, uh, and also we are we will start uh, middle of July is our expectation or end of July the the second part of of the capacity building that we started in in 2020 with a group of parties because we conducted a, as well a gap analysis uh, and with that we know uh, uh, what are the needs uh, and what parties need uh, to to strengthen uh, the support in order to complete play the national wetland inventory. So we will start uh, this process uh, um, uh, quite soon uh, and continue uh, basically the, this process in order that parties can, can deliver under the objective, objectives and goal of the convention on this, on this area. So that is from my side. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Laurent, and thank you, Maria, um, for the introduction. So, as Maria said, and Laurent, I am here as the Vice Chair to Ramsar Scientific and Technical Review Panel, but also as Principal Researcher in Earth Observation with the International Water Management Institute. And I just want to revisit very briefly in the next five, uh, seven minutes, um, what is needed from a geo wetlands um, in terms of what the STRP sees as focus areas and priorities, and how the geo work plan and a geo initiative can inter intersect. Um, with the Ramsar STRP work plan. So we're all aware that uh, wetlands are vital, eco vital ecosystems and um, healthy and functioning wetlands are really critical to human livelihoods and to sustainable developments. And yet the flagship publication of the Ramsar STRP, the Global Wetland Outlook, shows that up to 87% of global wetland resources have been lost and that wetland species continue to decline. And we're all well aware that there are multiple pressures on wetlands. And we've recently released an update uh, to that outlook uh, this year, which shows that unfortunately the situation continues to decline. So despite the work that we've done in this area, all of the great contributions um, to taking step forward to improve national wetland inventories, it really, uh, the work highlights that the urgency with which uh, wetlands need to be monitored um, and the information we need to provide um, cannot really, it cannot be underestimated and the critical uh, nature of this in a timely manner um, continues to be pressing. So this urgency is reflected um, in various policy uh, agenda. So wetlands are immediately important to several SDGs and we heard from Maria about uh, reporting on wetland extent and, and the Ramsar reporting and indirectly to many more SDGs as well. National wetlands uh, inventories are used to track 6.6.1, uh, the extent of water-related ecosystems, and earth observation data are also used as input, but there's a lot more potential here. In terms of the relevance for the global biodiversity goals and nature, 40% of all species live or breed in wetlands, and the negative trends in biodiversity and ecosystem functions are projected to continue or to worsen, and targets of no, not, no net loss really cannot be achieved without a better improved understanding and monitoring of wetlands, and also of restoring those which have been uh, degraded. More recently, uh, under the Glasgow Pact and for global climate um, agreements, many types of wetlands, but in particular peatlands, blue carbon ecosystems are exceptionally important in mitigation. Freshwater wetlands are crucial for the water cycle and maintaining water security, buffering extremes. And wetlands thus have the potential to contribute to both mitigation and adaptation targets. We also heard um, from Rihanna earlier the importance of, of, of MBS for climate change with far reaching benefits for, for nature and people and the role of wetlands within these. So wetlands are nature based solutions, they can contribute to nationally determined contributions and national action plans, but really in order to do this, we need to move forward the data that we can provide on wetland characteristics wetland extent and monitoring. So within this and addressing these goals, science and technology are really critical. 
Wetlands are typically inaccessible, as we know, they cover large areas. Many wetlands are seasonally, spatially dynamic. They're thus very well suited to the use of earth observation. We have a very solid foundation to build on here. We've got many existing examples, pilot demonstrations, a few global products for individual wetland types, toolkits and, and knowledge products, as, Lamont, uh, sorry, as Adrian uh, showed us um, earlier. And of course, Geo Wetlands, which provides um, the platform and the knowledge base collecting repository for these. We've also demonstrated through the scientific and technical review panel, this publication on the right, and how we can better use earth observation for wetland inventory, assessment, and monitoring. But we still have much to do. And really, um, this community that we're bringing together here has a huge role to play in this. What we're looking towards is how do we move, um, move from the individual pilot examples to operational large scale approaches, global outputs. How can we look at better integration across thematic areas, across the different initiatives? And how can we focus on co-creation? So end user oriented data sets and tools and services which really address the critical needs and the gaps of our end users. From the, uh, the STRP process, um, and with the Ramsar Convention, it really pro provides a platform like no other to foster the collaboration and partnership to support other international policy mechanisms and to support the use of the best available data, advice and policy recommendations to enable national governments to realize the benefits of fully functional wetlands. And so in terms of alignments um, and the production uh, of products, integration um, with, with national inventories, um, we're in the process at the moment where we've just completed uh, recommendations of work areas and priorities which have been submitted and will be addressed uh, by the next standing committee in a couple of weeks time, at the end of May, and which will prepare matters uh, for decision by the next COP. And so the STRP recognizes as high priority the need to prepare guidance on inventories and monitoring of small wetlands, as well as others, their multiple values uh, for biodiversity conservation, especially in the context of uh, land management and climate change. And really, I just want to emphasize that um, while we've made great strides in addressing wetland extent and SDG 6.6.1, there's much more that we can do here with the help of the, the EO community, because really we need to go beyond just extent to look at um, habitat, habitat type and condition, ecological character. And these are areas which really require development of approaches. And so just a few concluding remarks. There's really an opportunity here. Support is needed from the geo community, from the EO community. And monitoring of wetlands is crucial, but it's not yet good enough. So even basic information baselines are often weak. The national wetland inventories are important in planning and decision support at the national level, but they still need to be strengthened. And while they're also critical for each of the uh, the global policy processes that I mentioned briefly and what and wetland extent is a key indicator, we really need inventories to start uh, to move beyond these to include also state and approaches for this required development. Integrating wetlands at the national level into NDCs offers a way for countries to achieve more ambitious climate plans and where this is a gap where we really need, we have a chance here to provide the information in particular over the next 10 to 12 months as NDCs uh, will be updated. So I'm gonna stop there. I'm really looking forward to the discussions later today. Thank you very much and looking forward to the- Unfortunately, we will not have discussion directly with Lisa, but we have our colleagues uh, from uh, uh, Ramsar Secretary, in particular, Jerker, um, uh, that also can answer any question. Uh, I'd like to, I mean, uh, I'd like to thank again, uh, Ramsar Secretary and STRP for this presentation, because I think they open uh, uh, many opportunities of collaboration. Uh, Lisa just talked about how we could be more operational, more integrated and, and to discuss this co-creation. So I really think this meeting is, is about this, is, is about co-creating um, uh, um, collaboration for operational and, and integrated programs. And, and also, uh, Maria, you were talking about this microsite uh, uh, in the convention website to which maybe we could uh, uh, provide some support and also your help desk and, and how we can support the 39 contracting parties that have not yet undertaken this uh, inventory. So I think it's uh, what we, we really want to, to, to discuss today. Uh, so we, we ended our first uh, part uh, um, of the meeting. Uh, I want you just before we go on the second part of this brainstorm uh, to know if there is any question about this uh, this presentation uh, if so please uh, feel free to 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 raise your hand or talk directly as we are many people around the table so if you have any question 
or need any uh, complementary information from what was presented uh, on the Joe Wetland side. Uh, any comment from our colleagues? All right. So I think we need we need some warm up, some warm up, and so I will ask Julie to to help us to to warm up the people. I remind you, it's a brainstorm meeting. It's not a symposium. We want to hear you, even if you have difficulties. I have my strong French accent. Sorry about it, but so really feel free to 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 speak at this meeting. It's a, it's a brainstorm meeting, and so Julie, can you can you help us to to warm up the session? with uh, we're going to do uh, a, a participate participant introduction with the survey so Julie the floor is yours uh, yes hi everybody I'm Julie from the Jewish Secretariat I'm very pleased to be able to be part of this inspiring workshop so as uh, Laurent said we are going to share with you a survey about your um, background and where you work in, in which type of wetland you are involved, so I will put it now in the chat. Um, yeah, and Julie, with the type of wetland, be careful because you have some of the best wetland specialists here. Yeah. So I'm sure <laughs> they will they will perfectly answer. They will discover, they will know about it already. So now in the chat, uh, you can see that the, the link to the survey has been shared. So I don't know if, Laurent, you want to make again the, the, like, yes, the demonstration? Yes, I, I can. I will share my screen. So you go in the chat. Just click on the link and you will find the survey and I will at the same time fill it so that you see how it goes. Yeah, I think you see my screen, All right? So please also fill this form to help us to, to know who is here and uh, facilitate uh, interactions. Laura, you don't expect those who were there in the morning to do it again? Um, I don't think so. Yeah, I don't think it's needed. If you are well, you can uh, actually, Mar, because then the others see We'll see who is around the table. Yeah, you can do it again if you if you don't mind. Mainly not not email and everything, but mainly about um, um, you know the more thematic question. I think great. Well, uh, don't hesitate to do it again. So as you can see, take some time and uh, also know that depending on type of keyboard you are using, country you are coming from, it may take more time. Don't worry, we we will uh, let it open. So no no rush. And so when you arrive to the wetland types, you can either just answer the question 10 and uh, if you're more courageous if you know uh, more in detail and also when you see so this uh, 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 we are using the, the Ramsar wetland type classification with all type of wetlands and uh, it shows you that when we are talking about wetland extent uh, wetland boundaries it's it's a, it's boundaries and extent of many many different ecosystems and also reminding that in the system system it's not only uh, a natural environment we also have indigenous people or local communities that are very important for uh, conservation and also restoration of this wetland and uh, uh, so yeah if you want to go more deeply in this please do so uh, also you will really discover the diversity of wetlands we have on this planet and being with my teachers such as John Miller, Laura Hess and Evelyn Nova I'm sh even shy to, to fill this form I hope they don't look at it and then you submit and uh, Julie will uh, actually share the first results really feel free stop to share my screen and give you the, the voice back Julie okay so now we have 11 answers I thank you so, and we see the numbers mm -hmm. so take your time the ones that didn't finish no, no rush. Yeah. And just... you can see that the, um, uh, it's updated, updated live. So uh, everyone who is still submitting, we can see your results too. So we can begin with the first results. We had this same exercise this morning and we had really interesting observations and interesting results. So what we can see first is that oh, it's updating. We have a lot of very diverse kind of participants coming from very diverse backgrounds and sectors. So we have more here, academia and research, six people and intergovernmental, six also, but we see that there is a little bit of all these kind of sectors. So that is very interesting to see the diversity of participants and yes. uh, Julie, if I can jump mm -hmm. on this one, we we didn't invite the private sector yet. Mm -hmm. uh, she also worked with the private sector. This morning, we have some small, medium companies that uh, already participated, uh, that were invited. But this this will come in a second moment mm -hmm. of the discussion to include the, the work of the private sector. And so we can continue. And what we can see also 
is apart from the diversity of sectors is also the, the diversity of people coming from uh, a lot of different parts of the world here we have europe we have brazil kenya so again we have this interest coming from all over the world um, we don't see asia at the moment or america but maybe we can see then here is in which region the people are involved. So there is a lot of people that responded that their work is global. So really, uh, we can see that this topic is of global interest. And uh, the last result that is also interesting is to see what type of wetlands uh, you are working in. So there is the inland wetlands that is winning at the moment. But again, there is this diversity and really people working on these different sectors, different type of wetlands. So it's very interesting to see also that, again, more precisely, there is this uh, different type of wetlands according to the Ramsar type classification. And I guess also we have all of them. So again, a great interest in all in this field for a very diverse and very broad range of questions. And uh, the, this shows that really together here are like experts in their fields and uh, in this very diverse like constellations yeah. that are the wetlands. So thank you. Can you go back to the countries where we are now? It looks like the last, the last World Cup. It's so I, I <laughs> see that uh, our USA co colleagues doesn't appear. I, I know they are here and I see Canada, USA. So I don't know why it didn't appear. Maybe they submit or they would appear after it's uh, uh, it's not the final results. And uh, and so this morning we had, yeah, so people from Asia, uh, only Osamu, and I want to thank him. I don't know if he's still here because it's so late in Japan, but we had uh, Japanese, uh, Chinese, and also Pacific uh, region, uh, Australia, and other islands, uh, countries that were present this morning. We had a good, strong participation this morning. So it's great because it's really complement, and I think it's important for Brazil here. And maybe I think we had Panama. I don't know if it's now or maybe tomorrow. I mean, it's so many people I can't remember, but thank you, Julie. So it gives you a good transition to... Uh, uh, if you can stop to share your screen and I will actually share mine to remind where we are now and now we're going to uh, go to the to the next session that will be uh, moderated by Stephen uh, Ramage. Is it's not it's not Mark actually? Sorry, it's Lamert uh, Hilaridis. I didn't change this slide. That will moderate this session now. So Stephen, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Laurent. Hello, everybody. Uh, welcome to the afternoon session. Hope it's. Uh interesting and useful for you all. Um, I think we'll start with uh, Lamert doing uh, maybe just uh, a brief intro, if you want to, to, to do something, Lamert, and then I'll introduce the, uh, the sessions, the speakers in the sessions. Is that okay? Yeah. Thank you so much, uh, Stephen. Very, very briefly introduce myself. My name is Lamert Hilaridis, work for Wetlands International. I've been working there for the last 10 years. Uh, quite a lot with uh, the Ramsar Convention, with the STRP, and the Global Mangrove Watch, and uh, also the uh, Geo Wetlands. So I think as um, as Mark mentioned earlier today, the, the mission is to develop a, uh, a sustained global earth observation approach to, to wetland inventory, mapping, monitoring, and assessment. And I think one of the key words here is sustained. So there's many different projects going on, uh, but the project typically has an end date. And we'd like to look longer term and have these more sustainable uh, solutions in place. Um, one of the objectives to, uh, to achieve this is to make the Geo Wetlands Initiative a geo flagship, uh, which is like the, the top tier geo activity. And for that, we need three things. First, the community engagement. Well, wetlands are what? And the wetlands community is very vibrant. And judging by uh, today's turnout also, um, I think meeting this requirement is not going to be a problem. Uh, the second one is it needs to be strongly rooted in um, or anchored in um, the policy context of, of important stakeholders. Up until now, uh, there's some good examples of how this can be done, but also there's uh, some room for improvement. This one example I think where uh, of, of how you can do this is 
the technical report that was written by the geo wetlands community for the Ramsar um, conventions and STRP technical report uh, on how to use earth observation for the inventory assessment and monitoring of wetlands. And the third requirement is uh, resources and governance structures should be sustainable. Up until now, that has held us back the most. Um, so I think that should be an important focus of the outcomes of this workshop, how that contributes to, um, to this more sustainable longer term future. And one last thing, just from, from my personal experience working uh, for wetlands and Global Mangrove Watch Geo Wetlands is there is so much value to be added just by collaborating and aligning work. So four years ago in Global Mangrove Watch, we published this time series of global mangrove extent. I, I just put down on the line, just in the last four years, the spin-offs from that product, just by collaborating with people, uh, collaboratively raising funds for follow-up and um, has been a global mangrove topology, uh, a global mangrove restoration potential map, a flagship publication uh, that's State of the World's Mangroves, uh, a mangrove blue carbon layer, which is a, a fusion of work of different parties, so like uh, NASA and, and obviously the Global Mangrove Watch extent and the soil organic carbon uh, layer. And it's all in a way that meets concrete information needs by stakeholders working in a certain policy context. On the governance side, this mangrove work has been embedded in the Global Mangrove Alliance, so an alliance founded by five major conservation NGOs and has many more members, also university uh, research institutes, etc., um, which ensures its longer term future. And that's really something um, I would love to see us working towards in, uh, in geo wetlands as well. Thank, thank you, Lammer. So um, I, I should also uh, probably introduce myself. Um, my, my, so my name is Stephen Ramage, and I work to support all of the coordinators so who are working on um, the 2030 Agenda, the Sendai Framework, the Paris Agreement, and the New Urban Agenda. And, and it's a growing portfolio of coordinators, so Laurent is, is one of our coordinators, and I also lead the communications at, at GEO. So this session uh, is a repeat of the session we had this morning. And the goal of this session is to present existing programs that deliver earth observation products for wetland monitoring, inventory and assessment. So all stuff we've, we've been listening to. It's a list of existing international and regional programs that was shared and updated by uh, some of the participants. So thank you to those who completed the list. And with a few exceptions, the national monitoring platforms uh, were not, some of them are not listed at this stage. Uh, some of the different programs were presented this morning and then there's another batch now, um, but all of the recordings will be available. Um, so if anyone wants to, to look over those, you can do that. Um, and then there'll be another session tomorrow on the way the products are distributed. So at the end of these presentations, there'll be a, there's a, a bit more, maybe I'm, I'm not sure if Laura will go back to the sort of talk about the brainstorm session and sort of look at what was done this morning on the Miro, which was quite considerable. But um, let's, let's jump into the presentations first. Um, so the first one is from Anis Gulmami, who I can see is there, which is good. Uh, this is on SWAS platform products. And just to remind you, SWAS stands for Satellite Based Wetland Observation Service. So, Anis, over to you. Good. Thank you, Stephen. And thank you, Laurent. Thank you very much for the invitation. So, I will be very fast because I think that the agenda is quite busy. Let me just share my screen first. And in the meantime, I will present myself. My name is Anis Gelmani. I'm a project manager at the Tour de Valais Research Institute based in France. It's a research institute for the conservation of Mediterranean wetlands. It's a private research institute. Um, and uh, um, I'm working mainly on the 
uh, development of EU-based tools for the monitoring of these uh, ecosystems all around the Mediterranean Basin. And today I have uh, the pleasure to present you this uh, this uh, uh, project that we had uh, with uh, with many other partners, as you say, the, as you see, you can you can see the logos uh, in 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 this slide uh, um, between 2015 and 2019. It was a, a Horizon 2020 funded project uh, that uh, maybe you heard about. Um, and yeah, the name is Satellite Based Wetland Observation Service. Um, we, yep. Yeah. We developed a service during this project. We developed a specific service to 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 to, to help uh, different users from local, national, and regional uh, uh, scales to, to 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 derive maps and indicators from from Earth observation data, mainly satellite data, uh, through the development also of uh, specific software, uh, the geoclassifier software that we we have been using and we are still using for monitoring wetlands in the Mediterranean. I will come back to this later. Uh, um, but also by promoting this approach is based on Earth observation in general, so not only the source approach, uh, through uh, different training, uh, the organization of different training and capacity building uh, workshops. Um, and yeah, the, 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 the source also was one of the, the, the three main projects um, at the beginning of uh, the GEO Wetlands Initiative five years ago. Um, so, um, the SWAS provided guidelines and training on how to apply specific nomenclatures uh, and classification systems for wetlands uh, mapping and, and monitoring that integrates uh, also Ramsar definitions uh, for, 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 for wetlands and how to implement these definitions to produce maps on these ecosystems. Also bring information to decision makers uh, and prepare uh, or support them or help them to prepare reporting obligations including uh, the SDG for the SDG reporting. Um, and this was demonstrated through uh, different uh, test sites that we had uh, all over uh, the, 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 the globe, in Europe, in Africa, but also in Asia. We, had, uh, we have been working on more than 50 uh, pilot sites during this project. So this, just a quick overview of the different project, or different products, sorry that have been developed uh, during this project. So we have, for example, land use land cover products and land use land cover changes over time by assessing different time series, uh, water quality on uh, on, uh, on some uh, wetlands or water bodies, but also uh, some products that are, um, uh, that, that, that could come to support wetlands inventory, like uh, wetlands delineation or potential wetlands mapping, uh, soil moisture and surface water dynamic mapping. And in the middle, you have a list of different indicators that have been standardized uh, based on this uh, mapping protex. Uh, and in, in, in green, for example, you have some indicators uh, that uh, are used to assess ecosystem services provided by wetlands, for instance. Um, so the SWAS toolbox, uh, which is the main tool uh, that have been developed during this project, uh, in, in this toolbox we can, uh, we, based on this toolbox, we can uh, process data, mainly optical data, but also uh, radar data to produce maps and indicators. And this maps and indicators will feed directly the geo portal, uh, like for example, the, the, the geo wetland portal. Um, you know, it's easy also to integrate local knowledge for the classification based on this toolbox, and it was uh, this toolbox is available in in, in in a standalone version, but also integrated that could be in a version that could be integrated with RGIS environment, for instance. So just a few examples uh, on on the products that we uh, were able to produce based on uh, on this approach. Uh, here you have, for example, uh, the, the 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 largest Ramsar site in Algeria. Uh, for different time periods and uh, based on this assessment we have uh, we had produced uh, 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 indicators for more than 300 uh, sites all over the Mediterranean basin uh, from 1990 to uh, from uh, the 70s to, to 2020 and based on this assessment we have also calculated for for the Mediterranean basin the, the trend of uh, of, uh, of wetland habitats uh, using the wet index uh, 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 developed by the the, the, the UNEP 
uh, UN, uh, UNEP, yes. Uh, and based on this assessment, we have, for example, demonstrated that uh, more than 48% of natural wetlands have been lost uh, since the 70s. And now we are working on the on extending this uh, this approach for other Mediterranean imported Mediterranean wetlands. So, so all the red points here represent the Ramsar sites that are not monitoring yet, uh, and they will be the the the, the results for this uh, the, this uh, these sites will be available soon. Um, also, for based on the source approach, we have developed uh, some national uh, some approaches uh, or, or, or tools uh, to, to 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 support national wetlands uh, inventory. Uh, so you can see the publication in the in the in the, in the bottom. And this approach also is uh, uh, could be. Uh, easily adapted to the SDG 661 reporting. Here are some examples. Uh, for example, in, in Albania, uh, we have developed this new uh, updated inventory, wetlands inventory for the whole country. Uh, and based on the nomenclature that we have used, we can easily extract information on the SDGs, uh, the SDG 661 indicators, uh, like the example uh, that you can see here. And we have already developed the same inventory for Tunisia uh, very recently last year. And it's based on the same approach. We even have included some, uh, some habitat, wetland habitat that, uh, that, that, that were not included in the, in the first inventory, like the uh, marine area and the six meter depths. Uh, at, yeah, so here you have the, the, the example of the translation from the inventory to the SDG 661 in indicators uh, uh, as they are defined now. Um, yeah, and just to finish with this national inventory. So uh, the good news is that um, today <laughs> in Jordan, and we have we are discussing about the, the 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 wetlands inventory here in Jordan. So probably in the coming weeks and months, we will produce the same kind of information for for Jordan. So we are working with many different uh, Mediterranean countries to help them and to support them to update the inventory based on this source approach. Uh, and of course, as I said, this was uh, was one of the main projects uh, at the beginning of the Geo Wetland Initiative, and as Mark said, uh, it, it's also it was also built on the framework of the Geo uh, Geos uh, uh, Initiative uh, from from the beginning. So thanks a lot, and sorry if I was longer than expected. Merci bien, Anis. Um, what I'm going to, you know, it's not often I get to use my name, but it sounds like le ramage des, des oiseaux in the uh, in the background. Yes, <laughs> so, so, sorry for the noise. <laughs> because <laughs> no, it's very nice. It's very nice. Yeah, because in my room the, the internet connection was very bad, so I just went here and uh, it's a, yeah, it's a good environment. But, but, so, but sorry for that. At my bad French joke. Um, <laughs> so. Um, we're going to, I'm going to uh, encourage people to put questions into the chat um, and we will, if we have time at the end, we'll, we'll, we'll also take questions if people want to raise their hands. But I'm going to move on quickly now to Laura Hess and Laura is going to talk about contribution of the BONDS project and BONDS stands for Balancing Biodiversity Conservation with Development. So Laura, are you there? Hello, I'm Laura Hess. I'm a researcher in wetlands <clears throat> remote sensing at UC Santa Barbara. As Stephen said, I'll be um, giving a quick overview of some of the earth observation work that's been conducted over the past few years as part of a project called BONDS, Balancing Biodiversity with Development in Amazonian Wetlands. And BONDS is an international collaboration led by Marie-Paul Bonnet at IRD funded through a Belmont Forum and Biodiversa Joint Call for Biodiversity Research. Our main study areas are Kuduai Lake on the lower Amazon floodplain and the middle Jurua floodplain in the Western Brazilian Amazon. The goal of the remote sensing work in bonds is to map spatial temporal variability of floodplain vegetation cover, hydroperiod, hydrologic connectivity, and water properties to support a better understanding of how climate climate change and management practices 
may affect biodiversity of floodplain forests, fish, and phytoplankton. We're making extensive use of time series of radar data for mapping seasonal inundation patterns. And on the lower Amazon floodplain, large seasonal lakes and aquatic macrophytes are the dominant habitats. So C-band Sentinel-1 works very well. Whereas L-band PALSAR data is required to map flooding on the Judoa floodplain, which is mostly forested. Spaceborne LIDAR from the JEDI mission was combined with the Copernicus GLO-30 DEM, Landsat, and PALSAR data to map floodplain forest height and create a bare earth DTM for the Judoa floodplain and surrounding uplands. The DTM and satellite altimetry are being used for hydrologic modeling under current and projected climate regimes. 12 airborne LIDAR tracks acquired over the region by INPI's Earth System Science Center provided validation data for the DTM. Innovative studies from INPI researchers have successfully demonstrated the first steps toward mapping phytoplankton diversity of Amazon floodplain lakes from space. A satellite-based semi-analytical approach for estimating KD, the defense attenuation coefficient in optically complex waters using Sentinel-2 data was shown to have high accuracy. KD is an indicator of light penetration through the water column and using field spectrometry at wavelengths matched to the Sentinel-3 OLCI, the researchers showed that phytoplankton genera are organized according to their ability to use light in different spectral ranges, showing the potential of satellite measured KD as a proxy for phytoplankton diversity of floodplain lakes. Validation data is, of course, critical to remote sensing work, but it can be very difficult to obtain for seasonally dynamic wetlands in cloudy regions. The NICFI Planet Scope Monthly Mosaics for the Global Tropics are a freely available data set that provides unprecedented high resolution images of the tropics at a monthly time step. As seen in the time sequence here, the mosaics are extremely useful for assessing open water extent and hydrologic conductivity at five meter resolution. We thank Biodiversa and the Belmont Forum, as well as the national funding agencies of our consortium members for funding our bonds work. Thank you to Lahan and the teams from GeoWetlands, GeoSec, and Ramsar, and thank you all for your attention. That was great, Laura. Thank you very much. And that means I can move on quickly to uh, Adrian and uh, yes. Wetlands. Adrian, you're yes, uh, an old um, hand at this, so I'll, I'll pull over to you. Thanks. Uh... Stephen, so um, yes, I will try to be really quick on that. So the Demo Wetlands Project, which stands for Copernicus-Based Detection and Monitoring of Tropical Wetlands, was a project that we had from 2016 to 2019, a three-year project. And it was a rather small project. Basically, in a way, it was a follow-up project to this WASP project that Anis um, presented by just a small consortium of the RSS Remote Sensing Solutions Company and us uh, at University of Bonn. So a small consortium trying to, yeah, to try some of these newer approaches that we developed for, for wetland monitoring on a national scale and yeah, with a focus on tropical wetlands. And we did this in Rwanda and um, yeah, basically um, what's special about Rwanda is, I mean, it's it's a quite small country and it's an inland country, so there are no coastal wetlands, only inland wetlands. And um, yeah, basically the different wetland types are, on the one hand, there are some protected areas, so rather natural state um, wetlands. There is one Ramsar site, which is main, basically a peatland, the Rugezi wetland in the north of the country. And then there are many quite heavily or, yeah, some ex more um, extensively and some more intensively used uh, wetland areas, based mainly in river valleys, because yeah, Rwanda is quite densely populated and most parts of the country are used agriculturally. And so there's also peat extraction ongoing. And um, yeah, as I said, in some valleys, there's quite intensive agriculture and there are also some yeah more natural wetlands left still. And so, um, yeah, what, Demo wetlands try to do is really to assess how um, mainly Copernicus based um, EO data can be used for supporting national wetland monitoring or mapping activities. Um, yeah, to, um, to try to develop a variety of wetland information, different products that can support um, wetland management on the national level. 
And yeah, this was most of this was really based on the needs um, that we requirements that we could assess from uh, different national partners, but also based on yeah looking at the global conventions that have already been mentioned a lot here and what their requirements are with regards to national reporting, statistics, etc. And um, yeah, so mainly the Ramsar Convention, the SDGs, um, you, your environment, and um, yeah, also we had in mind to support your wetlands by this. It was basically a national demonstration project. And even though uh, monitoring was, is in the project title, it actually was more like a demonstration with data of 2017, so more the establishment of a baseline that could be used for yeah, more operational monitoring in the future, but because it was a quite small project, that was not, not something that we could achieve really, but yeah, something that maybe hopefully geo wetlands and other activities could support in the future. And so just to briefly give a quick overview of the different products that were developed. So it's quite similar to other projects we have already seen um, in the morning and also now. So one important product, of course, is the wetland extent on a national level, then the water occurrence. And also we were able to use the Ramsar um, classification to classify the identified wetlands on a national level based on the Ramsar classification system. and. Um, an additional project was uh, focusing on the wetland use intensity, where we tried to, to get an idea about how intensively the different um, wetlands, the agriculturally used wetlands are um, used by local populations. And um, so the last few slides are just an overview of these different um, products on a national scale. So this is just a land use land cover map for the whole country and then this is basically the the wetland areas extracted based on the wetland extent and then classified based on the Ramsar um, nomenclature where you can see in the bottom right the uh, different classes. I mean Rwanda is quite small as I said and it's only inland wetlands so the it's also not that many different wetland types that um, appear there so that's um, what we were able to do with regards to classification of wetlands. There are some water occurrence um, products where you can see the permanent water bodies and then in some areas the more um, dynamic water bodies that change throughout the year and um, yeah the last um, product as said is looking at the um, intensity of wetland use where you can I mean on this um, scale it's a bit difficult but you can see that in some areas where you have these red areas that indicate a quite intensive use of wetlands which mainly mostly um, is directly in line with the heavily agriculturally used um, used um, parts of the wetlands and then there are some more natural wetland areas like here in the in the north you can see this Rugesi um, wetland which is the Ramsar site which also shows quite low uh, usage um, levels and um, yeah I think that's it already thanks for the attention thank you Shen. um we will um there is a question um okay so i was going to point to anise but he's already answered the question from daniel so i'll move on we now have the global peatland initiative from patrick uh Schill. so patrick are you there thanks Stephen. I, I will be presenting so hi everyone uh, my name is Julie Van Offeren and I'm a consultant for the Global Pitlands Initiative. So first of all, I wanted to thank the, the GEO for the, the invitation and for giving us the opportunity to share our experience uh, as the GPI and to emphasize the importance of interdisciplinary collaboration uh, across sectors and across borders uh, for pitlands conservation, restoration and sustainable management. Um, so the Global Peatlands Initiative is an initiative that aims to uh, save peatlands as the world's uh, largest terrestrial organic carbon stock. So the initiative is uh, coordinated by Diana Kopansky, who unfortunately couldn't join us today, uh, and led by UN Environment Programme. So as we all know, uh, peatlands are a type of wetlands, uh, which are critical uh, not only for climate change mitigation and adaptation, but also for the multiple uh, vital ecosystem services uh, that they provide. And we as the Global Pitlands Initiative have been uh, working for results and impact uh, built on experience and approaches from science to policy and innovation to financing. 
So we believe that um, global collaboration is essential to protect peatlands. And in just five years, the, the GPI funded by the International Climate Initiative of Germany uh, has grown to a 48 uh, international mem member organizations uh, directly supporting four tropical uh, peatland partner countries of Peru, uh, Indonesia, Republic of Congo, and Democratic Republic of the Congo. Uh, but we bring together organizations and, and networks uh, from around the world to improve the conservation, restoration, and sustainable management of peatlands by bringing uh, science to policy. So within the GPI, one of our uh, priority areas of work is to know where peatlands are and how they're changing. And this, and this gap was also uh, highlighted in 2019 uh, during the fourth uh, UN Environment Assembly in the resolution on the conservation and sustainable uh, management of peatland, which was adopted um, by all member states and who committed to give a greater emphasis to the conservation, uh, sustainable management and restorations of peatlands worldwide, but also to create a comprehensive and accurate uh, global peatlands inventory, uh, which will be a cr crucial um, as a basis for identifying uh, the extent and uh, value of peatlands globally. And all of this um, in consultation with the, the Secretariat, uh, Secretariat of the Ramsar Convention. So currently, uh, we are working with uh, leading scientists from around the world to establish the state of the world's peatlands uh, through our global, global peatlands assessment, uh, which is a flagship product of the GPI. So this global peatlands assessment is being led by UNEP and coordinated by uh, UNEP WCMC with technical support from uh, partners, including the, the Ramsar Convention Secretariat. And it aims at uh, filling, the, uh, filling the knowledge and research gaps uh, on peatland distribution, status, uh, trends and pressures, uh, bringing the best available science uh, together to produce a global overview to inform decisions, influence policy and guide actions for the conservation, uh, restoration and sustainable management of, uh, of peatlands. So as I said, we need to know where peatlands are and understand how they are uh, changing. And it's through earth uh, observation technology and international collaboration that we are able to develop uh, the global peatlands assessment and create a global peatland inventory. So you may have, uh, already seen our global peatlands map, uh, which was launched um, at the global peatlands pavilion last year during the UNFCCC COP26. And it aims to improve the, um, the base knowledge on the location and extent of peatlands worldwide, um, supporting countries with enhanced mapping efforts uh, to inform decisions, influence policy and guide actions for the conservation of peatlands. And so all of this work uh, marks the beginning of a collaboration uh, between world-renowned peatland experts in all disciplines uh, to update, establish, and jointly communicate uh, the status and value of peatlands. And we hope that this global peatlands assessment uh, can inspire other initiatives and motivate uh, future collaborations to conserve all types of wetlands. So we believe that Geo Wetlands Initiative is a great opportunity uh, to work together uh, and we can all be part of the solution. And if you are interested in knowing more or if you have any questions about the initiative or interested in uh, working with us for peatlands conservation, restoration and sustainable management, please visit our website at globalpeatlands.org and feel free to contact, to, to contact uh, Diane and myself our contact details are on the um, on the slide, but I will also put our email addresses in the chat. Thank you very much. Merci, or thank you, Ben. I'm not sure which. Um, and our first hashtag. So I'll have a look at that after the session. Uh, thanks a lot. That was that was great. Um, now we're going to move to Erin Hester. Erin wins the prize for the longest title. This is EO for Wetland Biodiversity and Invasive Species Monitoring in California. Um, thank you very much. And thank you for the invitation to join you. Uh, I'm here uh, representing um, Freshwater Bond as well, the Freshwater Biodiversity Observation Network. 
So I wanted to start by just plugging um, our interest in working with geo wetlands. And I know this was registered in your uh, morning session as well. And so one of the things that I wanted to just highlight is that we have a, a shared history, um, a lot of met overlap in terms of membership and vision in what we do. And we're really interested in looking at um, systematic ways of tracking change in multiple dimensions of biodiversity across populations to communities, genetic species traits and ecosystems. And we have a lot of complementary strengths, particularly in the EO realm. And you heard from my colleague, uh, Heidi Van Denter this morning. So the geo, um, the GEO Wetlands membership uh, is a global community of practice that facilitates global assessments of freshwater biodiversity by combining remote sensing with in situ measurements at, again, all levels of organization. And we have over 360 members across 85 countries, uh, chaired by Aaron Turak, uh, Jennifer Lento, and Andreas Bruder. Um, and uh, again, you heard from my colleague this morning about um, some EO projects. And so I wanted to share with you briefly um, some of the work that we're doing in California with a focus on the San Francisco estuary, which is a Ramsar wetland of international importance and also contains a um, UNESCO site. And we're gonna focus primarily on this upwater component or the upstream component of the estuary, which is called the Sacramento San Joaquin uh, Delta. This is a um, freshwater system that includes both, um, well, it, ha it spans the range of saltwater to brackish to freshwater intertidal marshes, as well as a large matrix of um, managed wetlands, including uh, flooded agriculture that are managed for co-benefit of both biodiversity and food production. It includes $5.3 billion in food production economic output and is one of 25 global hotspots for biodiversity with over 50 native species that are listed under the United States Federal Endangered Species Act. It's also been called one of the most invaded ecosystems in the world and is highly vulnerable to climate variability and change due to its uh, positioning as a Mediterranean uh, climate system. So some of you probably are familiar with a site like this. This is uh, Ludwigia or water primrose, which is um, quite, in, uh, quite an infestation out in the rain area and has increased in fourfold from 2004 to 2016, replacing water hyacinth as the primary invasive species in the system, covering over 40% of the waterways in this region. Um, and so one of the things that makes this site really exciting to think about demonstrations for EO to really support our goals around wetland conservation and restoration is that California's Eco Restore program has mandated that the state will restore more than 12,000 hectares of uh, wetlands. Um, and they've invested a half million US dollars to date in restoration with a target of a total investment of $950 million. And of course, EO is going to be very important in identifying where those restorations are suitable, but also tracking restoration success and monitoring biodiversity and invasions in the context of these very large investments for the expansion of wetlands and restoration of habitat in this region. So, Typical platforms for vegetation mapping and uh, invasive aquatic vegetation mapping um, span the range from satellites to um, airplane um, to more recently the advent of drones uh, and uh, sensors mounted on those drones. Each of these comes with different trade-offs and uh, can be deployed at different scales. So one of the things that the state has invested in is beginning in 2003, they started piloting the use of airborne hyperspectral remote sensing to map and monitor the invasive aquatic vegetation in the system. This was work that was led by Susan Houston at UC Davis. That mapping is now at a near operational um, 
level. And so the state conducts annual flights in order to create these baseline maps of aquatic vegetation. And that hyperspectral sensor allows us to have the fine spectral detail that enable us to discriminate between water primrose and water hyacinth to the species and genus level, as well as the native uh, floating aquatic vegetation that all co-occur in the system. So one of the things that we've been working on is looking at how we can um, use drones to um, improve the spatial resolution of this work. So the aircraft uh, mapping is achieved at about a 90% overall accuracy with class specific accuracies for those target invasive species ranging between 80 and 95%. And uh, my, gra my graduate student here, Eric Fulch, uh, flew this very large drone. So for reference, this fellow is um, two meters tall. So they're very big drones. <laughs> um, and he was flying uh, mounted hyperspectral cameras on these drones and was able to achieve comparable accuracies uh, as well as higher spatial resolution. There are a lot of agencies both in California and across the globe that are interested in using drones for these wetland um, biodiversity monitoring. And a really important component of Eric's research is he demonstrated that while it is feasible to accomplish this mapping with high accuracy and we're able to get finer spatial detail, including identifying nascent invasions, which could be very important for early intervention for restoration success, um, he also calculated that it would take over 7,000 hours to fly the entire region with drones. And this is a very important thing to communicate to managers who want to start thinking about investing in these monitoring programs, um, that drone mounted data are useful, but we need to think carefully about how those are deployed, because uh, the reality is we can't send people into the field to, to accomplish this completely. We've also been looking at satellite sensors like Sentinel-2, which offer the ability to fill in the gaps. So this is a looking at the annual snapshots of airborne data that are currently in operation for the region. And this just showed us, shows us what uh, Sentinel-2 data, if we remove those cloudy images, would give us for this region. And using machine learning techniques, we were able to actually transfer those techniques from the hyperspectral mapping, airborne mapping, to Sentinel-2 at 10 meter spatial resolution and achieve comparable accuracy in both species level and genus level detection of these invasive species um, with an overall accuracy close to that 90% mark and with uh, class specific accuracies uh, ranging from the high 70s to the low 90 percentiles. Um, in addition, because we now have that high temporal frequency from Sentinel-2, we're able to start looking at vegetation dynamics. For example, examining the phenology characteristics and how they vary across vegetation type. And one of the things that we can see if we calculate the enhanced vegetation index from Sentinel-2 and we extract phenology metrics from that is that water primrose, that, that recent invader that is starting to grow up into the marsh and lead to marsh mortality, is starting to grow at a significantly earlier point in the season, and it also has a longer growing season. And we've also seen that there's extreme spatial variability in this, which is leading us to start understanding different invasion strategies that these um, plants are employing. So in summary, um, remote sensing is providing repeatable, consistent monitoring of vegetation functional types and invasive species for this uh, wetland of international importance. And is being used now by the state in that near operational capacity to make decisions about restoration targets and restoration management. And what we really need is a complementary set of tools, including airborne hyperspectral data, which have provided those baseline high quality maps for almost two decades now. But drone data, while infeasible to deploy across scales, is very useful for sampling at these high priority sites and monitoring targeted intervention regions. And then, of course, we're really excited about the advent of machine learning coupled with Sentinel data like Sentinel, uh, like Sentinel-2, which can miss some of those small patches, but fills really important temporal gaps for phenology and invasion dynamics. 
And one of the things that I want to emphasize here is that it took a long time for the state to adopt these maps and employ them in their decision making schemes. And one of the key aspects of this was a link between the remote sensing data and the field surveys, which enabled us to quantify the uncertainty for managers and provide traceability across scales for them to, to basically trust these EO products and, able, and, and then how, give them the confidence to incorporate them in their decision making. So I've put my contact information here and I'm happy um, if anyone wants to reach out, I'm happy to answer any questions. And I do hope that we're able to start a dialogue about how freshwater bond can, can work with geo wetlands to really meet some of those uh, shared goals around biodiversity. Thank you. Thanks, Erin. Uh, really enjoyed that. Some good facts and figures in there. Um, and as Erin said, if you have questions, you can obviously contact her directly or put something in the chat. Uh, unfortunately, Claudio Barbosa can't join us. So this is going to be our last presentation in this session. And it's from Felipe de Lucia Lobo on uh, Algae Map. So, uh, Felipe. So, hello, everyone. My name is Felipe Lobo. Uh, first of all, thank you, Lohan, and all your team for the presentation. I'm very pleased to, to, to be here today with you. Uh, my name is Felipe Lobo, I'm a professor at the University of Pelotas in the south of Brazil. And I'm also part of this GeoWaco Watch steering committee. And the GeoWaco Watch is an initiative to promote and facilitate the, the use of EO data for water quality projects uh, in a global scale. And during this process of being part of the Geo Rock Watch, we, we observed that there's a lack of data, especially for developed countries in regards to water quality and water quality monitoring. So because of this, this gap uh, about water quality, and I think it, I will be short here because of the focus, of course, is with the uh, wetlands. And uh, I will introduce you to you about the app application that will focus on water quality specifically. But we, the, 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 the importance of water quality monitoring, especially in developed countries, that we, as I said, is a lack of, of data. And then we, in a partnership with Brazilian Institute and, and other universities in Brazil and, all, and Latin America, it's been like a, almost two years now that we're developing this, this project called Algae Map for Algae Blue Monitoring Application for inland waters in Latin America. So we, because uh, Algae Bloom is a global issue, and then of course climate change is making Algae Blooms even worse. And because we, Observing that water quality is, is decreasing, right? The, the, the water degradation is increasing. So there's a huge demand for water quality monitoring system based on remote sensing imagery. And as Erin uh, and said previously, we we need to kind of convince the decision makers to and, and to use this kind of data for uh, policies. So that's our main goal here. Uh, so the idea of the algae map is to provide water quality information using the remote sensing, especially specifically Sentinel-2 data, to derive this nor uh, NBCI, the normalized chlorophyll index, from every single pixel in, in reservoirs and lakes we are interested. Um, here is the, how the app looks like. So basically, it's a very simple approach that we are trying to, to extend the, 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 the use of remote sensing data to other areas that are, that there are none or very little information, especially in remote areas in Latin America. So the, I will show you quickly here how it, it works. So basically, you can choose uh, a reservoir or a lake that is, is listed here. We have we're working on improving and, and, and extending to other areas. But I will start here, for example, the Living Lagoon. We're currently working hard on this 
coastal lagoons here in, in, in Rio Grande do Sul, close to Uruguay, which is a very large wetlands and, and lakes. And by choosing, it takes a little a while to, because it runs in Google Earth Engine, it's based on Google Earth Engine, so this project was, uh, there was support from Google Earth Engine and your data science for to give a little background and help us develop this, this. and then as if we, we select the place we will be able to have to look up for all the sentinel imagery data sets since 2015 uh, up to now and then you can choose for example a date uh, of interest for example select a specific point in the Nagin Lagoon, and then I would like to know uh, what, how many, uh, what's the chlorophyll con concentration in that pixel, how many uh, sea images we have during this period, and we can also have uh, some charts of chlorophyll wave along this period, and the trophic state index for this water body, and we can also look at individual images specific dates we can see for example how it looks in mean, like on June 11 2000 and then you can choose here uh, the dates of interest for example and then you show RGB for the sentinel two images and then uh few a concentration there are other products here But for, to, in order to extend this to other regions, and specifically in other countries, we need, as was previously mentioned as well, that we need to have a, a, a better um, data set because it's really hard to, to access a water quality data from, from other countries. And even within Brazil, there's a lack of this information. So we are um, working on gathering this information to improve the algorithms for, for chlorophyll wave concentration and thinking for other projects. And also that's one of the, the initiatives from INPI, Claudio Barbosa can, cannot present today, but they are also working on uh, generating water quality products based on Sentinel and SAC and other EO data and, and make it more uh, precise and, and have more data, uh, optical data to improve the algorithms. So we, for, for, from our side here, we're trying to extend that to other regions. And I think with geo wetlands, we will help us to uh, collaborate with other groups and get to know other groups that are working on, on the same subject and exchange some information about this important uh, important resource, right? So we'll, that's our, the Algemac application that I would like to introduce you, and uh, and that's me here today. Thank you so much again, Rohan, and, and all the, the colleagues for the invitation. Obrigado. Thank you. So um, we've that's all the presentations for this session. Um, I just want to highlight a couple of comments in the chat, one from uh, Daniel June at Conservation International, who's part of the um, eo for ea um, leadership, the ecosystem accounting uh, working group in the work program, and also from Julie, who just um, spoke. So if you want to just take note of those. And then uh, I big thank you to everyone for giving up the time and for your your for putting the materials together and for your talks. And I will hand back to Laurent and Julie and Lamar as we talk about the uh, the Miro and what's next. So thanks again. Yes, thank you, Stephen. And also I see Maria that is with us. Uh, thank Maria for saying it was a long day. Huh? Yes. But uh, I hope you feel good. Maria, we want to comment. Yes, actually, I, I have, a, yes, it's more like a comment, not a, a question, but it was based on what uh, Tour de Bala presented. 
that is very interesting, of course, in the support for parties and, and in general, all the other uh, presentations and cases were very interesting to, to listen, to know what is, uh, what is happening uh, out there. But in general, I think it will be important for the GEO community uh, to take in consideration how this information um, can reach to countries that are the ones reporting. Because when I see a really nice experience in Rwanda and in other places, but when I look, uh, we don't have data. So those countries are not reporting because they are not aware probably that this is happening. So it will be important, I mean, as a way forward and looking, of course, the, the opportunities of collaboration with us on, on these processes, how, how this information get to countries, who who is, who are your the partners on, on on those countries are countries because we find even in our case so that even some parties are not aware you know what are the needs of reporting under the convention what is in the national report that they need to report on, on this indicator or in others but we are talking about 61 of course that is very important or in wetland inventories because we have uh, three, three, three indicators in national report regarding indicators. Not, so it's not only, and we are not focused only on, on wetland stain, of course. So it, it's important, you know, how this is available, how these parties can be aware because they are the one officially reporting, reporting, reporting to us. So I see, I am very interested, of course, on, on some of the, of the, of the experience that have been presented and for uh, most probably will be doing a follow-up exactly because we see that that is important we are at, at the at the moment with the consultant support as well we are reaching we are looking exactly to which other data is available so this this exercise has been very helpful for for us as well so we will be definitely reaching to some some of you uh, to find out more about the data and that can be used but i can tell you that uh, Many countries are not aware of this. So, Anise, so, so, so you can simply, we can, of course, follow up bilaterally. But if at this stage you can just mention a little bit who are your contacts and who, who were your partners in the, at the country level. Thank you. Yes, sure. Thanks, thanks a lot for this very relevant comment. So, very quickly, for the two examples that I have presented on Albania and Tunisia, for Tunisia, we are, we have, been working with the Ramsar focal point um, uh, there, uh, and uh, the, 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 the wetlands inventory that we have developed was also in the framework of the implementation of their national wetlands in, uh, strategy. So they, 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 they will release a new wetland strategy, national strategy very soon. Uh, for Albania, unfortunately, uh, yeah, we tried to link uh, this work with, uh, with their national reporting obligation, Ramsar, but also for other international conventions but uh, it's not uh, as uh, as uh, as good as we're, we we are expecting and uh, just to finish my answer by saying that we are also working with medwet and which is the regional initiative uh, ramsar initiative in the mediterranean and we rely also on medwet i see that alessio uh, the, the medwet uh, coordinator is here with us today uh, yeah we rely also on on, on this regional uh, initiative to put or to to to, to link this scientific and technical work with the with the with the countries and the official representative Ramsar uh, from Ramsar and Medwet in these countries, uh, for for jo for Jordan. Uh, I'm today here in Jordan, so we are also in discussion with the, with the, with the national authorities uh, to implement a new inventory in, in the country, and this is something that also that we we will try to integrate within their uh, framework uh, reporting framework for Ramsar and the SDGs. Um, yeah, we will follow up uh, for sure. Thank you very much, Anis. And I, I'd like to 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 also say some words, uh, Maria, about your comment because I think how this data, this uh, result from some scientific projects, reach reach the the, the users. I, I, it's always a, you know it's always an issue. And I think also this geowetans community being uh, being live, I think we can actually facilitate that also when some researcher are uh, uh, asking for new resources for new project if they can have a direct link with ramsar with some convention also be sure that they are actually helping on that they will help them to have the resources and they will also help you to actually and the countries to to deliver so i think this uh, we have to close this loop 
uh, it's not an easy task, uh, but it's, I think it's possible when we have communities discussing. Um, I don't know if there is a, on the other comment. Yeah, no, I saw a comment from uh, from Felipe. So yeah, thank you very much, Felipe, also for the presentation. So we started already uh, the discussion. You know, so it's 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 an ideation workshop, and we have seen that we have many existing programs on the wetlands, many different products. Uh, a very diverse community, and we have some um, some specific needs, and 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 that's why we we really wanted to organize this workshop with uh, our Ramsar colleagues because we have this inventory, and 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 Maya said it again. We don't, I mean, many countries don't report how we can help on that. We have so many, so much data, so many, so many specialists. How can can we really help to have this inventory and then go further on all those issues what we, we that we raised also today? So um, now we, what we're going to do we we decided to i mean it will be a support but also feel free to to enter in this discussion it's a moment where we it's a brainstorm moment uh we uh we'll share with you uh, a mirror platform so in the chat you will have uh julie that will share the the link uh yeah it's uh samuel samuel just did it he shared some explanations about it and uh uh, uh, we will continue the work we started this morning. Uh, the idea is to, uh, uh, so uh, also with the invitation, we share the list of existing programs. It's a list, some, some of you already completed it. If some programs are missing, please continue. You can do it directly in the mirror also. And also we, we linked it to, to some uh, uh, needs that actually uh, Earth Observation can, can support. So I will, I will myself click, click on this uh, link and share my screen. So that you understand what I'm talking about. Here we go. So I invite everyone to to share this. Uh, uh, exactly. Yeah. All right. And I see already some people that are connected here. So as you see, this was a result of this morning. And you see some uh, uh, programs are missing. And uh, you see, for example, from such as Bonds that Laura presented today, uh, uh, we didn't detail it. And I will let Julie now. Uh, Julie, if you can, uh, uh, um, I will just be sure I will turn this off. And if you can show us, now Julie, please share your screen to show us how this Miro platform works. Thank you. Uh, so yes, here, I hope you see my screen. Um, so when you enter the, the Miro platform, uh, you will see these different boards. So the first one that we want to, to complete is this big one with the co two columns. So the first column is the one with all your programs and projects. And the second one here with the user needs um, for which uh, Earth of Observation can, um, can be used. So if your program can be linked to one or more of these user needs, um, you will have to make one connection link. And then now I can show you more specifically how to do it. So you can zoom in and the zoom in like you want. So if you take like one of these post-its, uh, you will have like these little bullets that will allow you to make, to draw some lines. So if you click on this bullet and why you hold the, the left click, you will be able to, uh, not always, but you will be able to draw a line uh, that will go to uh, the, the user need that you want to link it. So once you've done it, you can change the color of the line, it can be blue, uh, red, green, depending on here we make, we made the instructions, depending on the scope of your program. So if it's local, it's red, national blue, regional green, and global, it's yellow. Um, and if your program, or if you want to add more user needs that um, you think could be added, you will just have to add more sticky notes. So here on your sidebar, you will have here the sticky note that you can have a color and create a new one and write in there. So I guess that's, that's it. I hope it was yeah. clear and not easy that if, if you have some questions or comments. Thank you, Julie. Thank you so much. I think it was perfectly clear. You can stop to share your screen and so you can help the others. I will share mine. Uh, 
so that we have a view. So uh, let me explain a bit better. And I, I, I would like to invite our Jewettens colleagues to remind uh, what are the objectives of this uh, uh, session, a brainstorm session, and what we, we get from this morning already. I don't know if uh, Lamert, uh, uh, Adrien, or Mark want to, to jump already in the discussion. Thanks, Laura. Uh, no, no, I can say a little bit uh, about this. I think one of the things this, um, this brainstorming exercise allows us to do is to help um, get an overview and categorize existing activities. Um, and this could show us also opportunities for, um, for the upcoming geo wetlands work plan, for example, and how to structure it, um, uh, which projects to, to engage, etc. I think this morning was, um, uh, was a nice example of how we, we started a bit hesitant and how, wait, how does this work exactly. I think, Julie, you, you gave a great explanation. Maybe just a fun highlight of this morning. I think there was one of the ideas posted was to create an, not an inventory of, of wetlands, but an inventory of wetland research, a geospatial inventory. So you'd have a map with basically showing you which research has been done where that it was an interesting, fun idea, at least. Um, so yeah, uh, I don't know if uh, Adrian or Mark, you have anything to add? I think otherwise we, we can get started. We have a bit over 20 minutes left. Thank you, Lamert. Any, any more comments? So also, uh, please. yeah, please. Yeah, no, maybe ju just one point, because you have, uh, we, we had it actually, um, yeah, dashboard, for, for a board, let's say, whiteboard for IDs, huh? for things that are not directly related to um, to uh, to a given user needs or products or to a, a program. So any IDs that uh, that you could, yeah, that, that's the place you should use actually. What is not really, what is more generic, let's say, and that's not related directly to a given uh, product or a given uh, a given activity. Yes, thank you, Mark. And as you can see, also, we have, for example, we had some proposals that we didn't integrate. We had enough presentations today, but you have more. Uh, we, we, you have uh, this project, Wet Main Areas from Iphigenia, Keramit, Keramit Soglu. As you can see here, and, and this is the first comment, it's also uh, we wanted to, 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 to know who is, uh, who is here today, who is interested about uh, uh, participating to, to this Geo Wetlands uh, initiative, you know, uh, and, 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 and from that, we wanted also to, to show that we have so many existing programs. And when you see this, and so many actually uh, products that can be useful for, for final users, we need coordination. I mean, we know we need coordination between uh, uh, the Secretariat, the STP, the, 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 the US Observation Communities that is represented by Jim, and, and more broadly, uh, because wetlands and other activities are interdisciplinary, we can go broadly. And so that's why also we, we invited colleagues from other activities. Uh, today, this afternoon, we had freshwater bond geobond colleagues, but we also had before Aquawa, Geoglos, uh, and, and other activities. We have Euphoria also today, other activities that could also uh, contribute and also benefit fit from what could be this Joe wetland. So I think it's to participate to this exercise also, it's to actually see the diversity. It's also good for our Ramsar colleagues to see how we can help them to be connected to so some of the presentation we had, some of the programs. So they, some of them already know about them, some they may not. So, uh, and it's, we'll see, I think one of the goal of Joe wetland would be also to, to keep, uh, this discussion live, you know, it, it's not one workshop that we need. We need to have some uh, continuity about it. So, uh, um, and 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 so today it's really about the products, about what Earth Observation can can produce in terms of content. And tomorrow it will be more about the platform, how we uh, we reach the user, as Maria said. Uh, how we deliver with whatever platform, but also how we can look together for new resources to have this sustainable monitoring. And also there might be some need of capacity development because sometimes it's not a final product that you want to share. You want to share capacity so that the users can produce their own product. So you have different configurations, different situations, different uh, 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 local realities. And we also have some, and we didn't put everything here, but some, for, some of these projects are, for example, in the same region, some are global. But uh, here in 
the regional project, we may also have some collaboration between projects that are acting in the same region. And, and this, is, this should be also part of the, of the discussion. Um, I'd like to see if there is any comment uh, at this stage for, on, on this exercise or people that want to, to complement on, on what was said or also on, on, on their programs that is uh, uh, being shown here. And, and if they want to, 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 to explain how they contribute uh, to this need. And finally, also, we said we could change the list of, of programs, but you also can change the list of this uh, 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 wetland product uh, from EO to address user needs. You can also add some if you, if you wish, feel free to. So any, any comment from, from anyone to, to, to continue the discussion? Maybe one, one point, I, I didn't raise my hand, but I went, <laughs> since I saw that some silence, I, I took the floor. I think th th there is le a different level of, of maturity on, on the products and even sometimes even inside the products. Huh? We know that we are different sciences. I mean, we, we've seen actually that very often the solution is in the, is in a multi-sensor uh, type of uh, approach, and and we are new sensors coming in the in, in the futures, and uh, at least that I can say for the Copernicus program that we have, the the, the, the new expansion sentinels that will come soon. So we will need to, at a certain point to capture this and to give, let's say, some uh, some visions about what what is coming in the near future. Uh, but for Ramsar, I mean, and it's clear that anything that uh, that is operational should be very well communicated. And, uh, and there is a number of these products that are already uh, operational. And uh, so, so we need at some points to, to look a bit about the maturity level and what is coming, let's say, to also communicate all of this. But this is not what we have to do today. Huh? This will be done in a second step. Huh? Yes, exactly. Good point, Mark. And, and, and also it's something we'll discuss tomorrow about having this leadership group. And I, I, as I don't know if everyone will be here tomorrow, I also invite uh, people to engage uh, on this leadership group to continue the discussion until the end of the year. And we will prepare the implementation plan with the help of Madiha. Madiha is our new job work program coordinator and she will, she will uh, moderate uh, tomorrow the session about the implementation, but already as I see some uh, uh, important names here so, so that they, they know that we are, we are uh, uh, really inviting them to, to actively participate, to help us to define this better. And it's really a prototype of a uh, way of doing brainstorm. I don't know if Laura wants to say anything. I've seen you are active on the board. Um, uh, how do you feel to fill this board, Laura? Please give a, give a first comment. Yeah, and I see you raise your hand actually. Please, Laura. Uh, yes, actually, I just, I'd like to uh, ask a question uh, about Ramsar, a question for Maria, I guess. Um, is there, uh, in terms of the national inventories, um, is there a, a, a priority list for which countries um, are most in, in need of, of input? And I, I think it's a, a, a dual thing of in need of input and also that there's someone actively interested in receiving the input because um, any suggestions? in that area. Thanks, Laura. If I were I'm sorry, colleagues, I don't know if Maria is still there. I see that we still have some secretary at convention people. If they can, if they uh, can answer Laura's question. Yeah. Laura and Laura, uh, thanks for the question. If Maria has stepped out for a moment, let me briefly answer. And this is actually a comment I wanted to come back to that I made in the morning session as well. And, and it's really about staying very close to what has been identified as priorities through the convention process in developing inventories overall in, in building the whole Geo Wetlands Initiative for the purpose of actually achieving that utilization of the data to really connect the user um, to, to the data products. Uh, there's a multitude of potential uses and all of them have a lot of good arguments attached to them. And at the same time, because there is that multiplicity, uh, it probably makes sense to use a, a sort of quite a hierarchical approach where at some levels, the focus is really on on the, the, the top level uh, core common 
users or, or, or products, whether it's SDG indicator 661, we talk about a lot, the simplest extent, but hugely important, and then building from there additional ones. So I think I referenced a few items that parties to the convention uh, have prioritized in resolutions uh, that relate to uh, extent, uh, the categories, the types, uh, as simple as that, but then also looking at aspects that relate to the, the carbon fluxes in systems, and especially those systems that are important for, for mitigation, so peatlands, blue carbon ecosystems, but uh, potentially beyond. Uh, and there's more to it than that. Uh, I'd rather defer to Maria on a, a more specific list, but needless to say, this is things that there is a, a, a catalog of from the convention process and from the work of the scientific and technical review panel. And so uh, uh, using this as a wet geo wetland initiative evolves will probably uh, have a much greater effect in terms of getting these data into the national reporting and into those global data sets and into the tracking against targets. But I hope that at least halfway answers your questions. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Jack, and thank you, Laura. Yes, and I, I, I also consider this will be important discussion from the new implementation plan, how we, we address this uh, uh, um, priorities. The first exercise today, we actually op opening all the boxes to look what we have in all these boxes, and, and, and from that, uh, to build priorities, also to engage. And now I see John Milak. Please, John, you raise your hand. Please, the floor is yours. Well, I didn't want to interrupt you, but yeah, I wanted to follow up with the last two, two uh, topics that were being discussed. <clears throat> Looking through this list, <clears throat> excuse me, um, on the on the right, the um, green boxes. Um, what's striking me is that there's almost nothing about um, ecosystem function. Um, in other words, um, productivity, gas flux. Um, which is understandable. I understand the, the key, the first goals are boundaries and, and extent. But um, you know, if you think about the Earth system modeling community and you look at what those people are doing, <clears throat> you look at how they model wetlands, um, almost all of them do a very, very poor job with wetlands. They characterize vegetation types in a very, um, very simple way. And so there's a, to me, there's a huge need for the, to, to bridge the communities that are doing this really excellent work that we heard about today and other examples with this larger air system modeling community and with estimates of ecosystem function, especially in interest right now, of course, you're all aware, I mean, methane fluxes from wetlands are really important globally. Um, and, to, and to do those and estimates, you need to, besides field data, you need good modeling results, you need an understanding of the plants and what they're doing um, with, with their productivity and so forth. So I guess that's my most noticeable observation here that there's, an un, and it's understandable where we are, but I think there's a huge challenge here to extend this work to be more um, functional and less um, related to the existence of what's there and how big it might be. That's more of a comment, a question. I, I mean, I know it's a, it's a big topic and we can't deal with it today, but I, it's just, a, it's an observation that I've, uh, I've been making and have made for quite a while. Thank you, John, and we are sure you know what you're talking about. It, it's always been challenging for geo community to to actually include this modern community. It's also huge. But I see colleagues from uh, Ramstein and Mark that uh, also raise and maybe to answer your, your point. Uh, thanks. Just uh, on that very comment, which is a uh, very, very apt one. In the convention framework, those of you who have been very close to it know uh, the term commonly used is here is ecological character status. And of course, the convention is about maintaining the ecological character status of wetlands in order to safeguard their provision of services and so on. And uh, uh, there is probably a fair bit that could be done in relation to uh, to to yeah, uh, observation and increasingly modeling uh, to to track changes in ecological character state, defining it to in in some instances better than has been done, and and then certainly being able to to track changes in order to manage better. So a good point. Thank you. Thanks again, uh, uh, John. Yeah, Mark, you you raise your hand. Yeah, you know, I, I wanted to say, yeah, I, th I think it's a good point. I think we, we, we at some point, because this afternoon there was not much 
uh, about modeling. In, in the morning, we had a few examples. And I, I see two aspects of modelings where we definitely need to bring them into, into the community. One is, is the modeling of the ecosystem services. And we had a very uh, this brilliant example this morning from your colleagues and Laurent. Uh, and, uh, and if you are aware a bit about the way the ecosystem accounting is done, for example, ecosystem extent conditions and, and services, all the services part is done essentially through modeling. So, so here we're not talking about the ecological character of wetlands, but more modeling the services, for example, carbon modeling just to give you an example of so one of the services that is provided by, 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 by wetlands. So definitely the, this modeling committee needs to be involved. The other one, the earth science modeling, this is more about the, the ecological character of wetlands, the, the integrity of wetlands. It's more in the science, let's say, but, but it's equally important. So, uh, so uh, it's, it's in the Ramsar Convention because maintaining the ecological character of wetlands, as Yaka said, is part, of, it's one of the targets of, the, well, I don't know if it's a target, but at least is within some targets of the convention. So we, we need to have the tools actually in order to assess the integrity of, um, of wetlands and, and, and in particular the resilience to the, um, to, to, to the drivers of changes. And the drivers of changes for wetlands have been very well identified. Huh? Uh, so we have climate change, with climate change, we have invasive alien species, we have a change of land cover, of course, we have exploitations, uh, so, um, and, and pollution. So, and all this, all this is done through, through modeling uh, and sometimes through a system modeling as uh, through biogeochemical -geo models. But this is really, in some aspects, this is really a science modeling. But I think at some point we need to see what are the priorities, but it's definitely also part of the, of the work that the community should be involved in. Thank you very much, Mark. I think it's-, so, it's Sorry, it's, can yeah. I jump in? I mean, oh yes, Maria, oh, yeah, you're back. Sorry, yeah, sorry. I, I, need to, I need to leave for a while, but I understand that Jerk also already contributed. However, um, however, for um, it's important as well for the community that uh, Article 3.2 of the convention is on the change on the ecological character and parties have the obligation to report to the secretary that on any change. There is a, um, a lot of guidance coming from the from the convention. How parties can use the guidance in order to to report on on, on ecological character, more from the technical point of view. No, I wouldn't say scientific point of view, but more for the technical and practical uh, point of view on on reporting on on, on change on the on the ecological character. So anything that is of course related with that is is very relevant, of course, for for cases in particular. Uh, for 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 Ramsar side where there are where there are where there are changes, but very relevant as well because parties are the ones that need to report. So the reports are uh, under the convention is report from contracting parties, not from third party reports. That of course, if, if we receive plenty of of, of claims so for some cases, and of course we address them directly with the, our national authorities uh, in the countries in the relevant countries. So of course it could be an element uh, coming from 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 the initiative, your initiative, how um, how um, changes in the ecological character can be measured. There is, as I said, many many substantive uh, guidance and cases um, in the under under the convention with the work that has been done by the by the STRP in the past year. The thing is how practical information now could be used to support countries countries reporting, but I have to tell that it's a very sensitive matter, a very sensitive matter for the for the for for, for the parties when these issues happen. And for that we undertake ransom advisory missions. So as part of the of the of the missions we go for wherever there are issues in a in a ransom site um, at the request again to the to the contracting party we that we cannot go or on our own or because we receive um, um, a third party report, we cannot under, we don't operate like that under the conventions. We need to receive the request from the, directly from the contracting, from the contracting party. But I see, for example, if there are any experiences, any, any processes that uh, on this experience that you have show where there are, um, where you have worked in changes in the ecological character, of course, we will be interested in knowing where are those experiences. To, to know, for example, if we are conducted in a country, a Ramsar advisory mission, you have undertaken, you know, some of this assessment, and you see that, you know, that there are changes in the ecological character, of course, that will be 
uh, very useful for those purposes. Thank you very much, Maria, for for completing. It's 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 really you see it's really good to have Ram Sarkis because I think you we always come back to the reality uh, of this work of inventory. So thanks, John, for for the comments, and we still we'll still have to brainstorm about how we can include such uh, such issues uh, correctly. Uh, we are almost at the end of this uh, uh, afternoon uh, workshop. I, I I put a note here. Judy was reminding that we. We wanted to have some coders if uh, the scope of your program was more regional, national, or local, or global. So please, uh, uh, if you can modify the code of your line, it would be great just to have the final view. But look at, uh, look at what we have already. I mean, it's, uh, it's quite amazing. The job that uh, has been done today, uh, we started from uh, from zero on this uh, mirror uh, map, and now we have, I mean, a very uh, a very nice overview of uh, most of the existing program uh, using your observation for for wetlands inventory uh, reporting and assessment, and, and some of the products that are linked. So I think it's it's great. Congratulations and thanks everyone for 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 that. Um, um, our, our wrap-up will be very, very quick. I, I want to thank again uh, our Joe Wetlands colleagues and the Ramsar uh, Secretariat uh, and STRP and also um, our Geo Secretariat colleagues here. We will continue tomorrow again with a morning session uh, starting at 8 until 10 a.m. CET uh, and, and uh, at four from 4 to 6 uh, uh, in the afternoon. And tomorrow we will discuss more about how we can actually deliver this product uh, to the users, how we can collaborate to have uh, uh, more countries uh, uh, benefiting to, from this work to actually uh, uh, provide their inventories in due time, and uh, how we can also collaborate about uh, capacity development, how uh, we have Alessio Sata here that will also moderate with Badiha tomorrow session about regional cooperation and wetland-based solution to go further than inventories. So um, uh, please join us tomorrow. Uh, please uh, uh, save candidate tomorrow to participate to this leadership group. We will say it's a pre-steering committee group. It means you don't have to engage for the, 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 the entire uh, time of the Azure Work Program from 2023 to 2025, you have to engage until November of this year, and you will decide after you want to engage on a longer time. But we, need, we really need most possi people possible to, to, uh, to, to revive this geo wetland activity. And the Geo Secretary uh, will be here to help you. I don't know if Yana is still here and if she wants to, to say uh, um, some last words. I mean, thank you so much, Yana, for. Uh, uh, authorizing us and pushing us to 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 try this new way of doing brainstorm meetings was really useful. The floor is yours for for concluding remark, and maybe at the end I will take it back to Maria if she wants to say some last words. Thank you, Yana, yeah. please. Go on. You always do such a good job as an MC. I really don't think there is much else to uh, to add other than really thanks. Thank, massive thanks to those who uh, joined us for both sessions in the morning and afternoon and um, Mark and Adrian in particular um, and, and to um, everyone really. And Maria, thanks for coming back in the afternoon as well and share the uh, sort of the perspective from the secretariat uh, side. Um, look, we're, we're, we're obviously we're quite excited about this one. Um, I wanna say we saved the best for last um, but it's probably not the last um, really sort of impact driven activity that we'll be putting together, but this is a special one because it really, um, the way we see it is really leveraging all of our experience that we've generated in developing and um, implementing the Global Forest Observation Initiative, the Global Biodiversity Observation Initiative, and uh, several others who have come before. Um, and also what's uniquely important about this effort is that this is really a uh, precursor to our sort of next generation post-25 geo uh, portfolio development. So um, there, there's a lot riding on, on this effort and we're hoping that we'll figure out exactly for the best formula for how to connect these dots, how to uh, build on the legacy of the projects that have demonstrated good results, but really give them the space and the opportunity to continue um, and, and, and get plugged into the various workflows and various solutions 
um, that the, the countries and other really uh, users can, um, can take advantage of. So thanks. And uh, tomorrow things will get uh, practical and tactical and uh, we're looking forward to it. So please do come back. Thanks, Yana. And Maria, I'd like to give you the floor to conclude. Um, Hi, thank you. Thank you very much from us in the Ransom Secretariat with Jerker and, and the team. I mean, uh, the rest of the team, we are very happy to uh, be able to participate. It has been very, very fruitful to listen to all these initiatives that, that are there, that are super, super useful, the enthusiasm that is there. So we are very happy to uh, being able, uh, being part of this of this process. Uh, we will be joined uh, as well tomorrow <laughs> to continue listening to, to the discussions and as well then waiting for you <laughs> to see how <laughs> we are going to put all those pieces together uh, and then we will move uh, from there. So thanks a lot. Thanks, Maria. Reminded that it was recorded, so we will share with you, with everyone, uh, the video. The mirror will stay live, and also we'll share presentation. Thank you, everyone. Have a good rest. Uh, good day for for our friend in California, and good rest for our European colleagues. And uh, see you tomorrow. Bye bye. Thank you, Nahan. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye -bye. Thank you very much. Bye. <laughs>